Hi everybody, this is lecture 17 for dynamics. Uh, the topic that we're going to cover today is section 14.2 in your textbook. It is also the final lecture of chapter 14 and the final lecture before we review for the midterm exam. So getting started, uh, the two documents that I will reference will be the PowerPoints for chapter 14, which is found right here on our Moodle page. We'll be covering slides 13 through 20 on that set. And then the notes for Dynamics Lecture 17, which show a word problem that I'll do uh, after I talk about the PowerPoints. So getting started, uh, first of all, everything that we talk about here in section 14.2 is very much related to the material 14.1. Basically, that if you have a system of discrete particles, that the energy momentum uh, in, both, in both the linear and the angular form can be viewed as a sum of the quantities of that particle. So this first slide talks about the kinetic energy of a system of particles and it basically says that if you have a uh, relative reference frame, if you know where the, the center of gravity and you have a center of reference that is relative to <clears throat> to that center of gravity of the overall system that the kinetic energy of the system is equal to the kinetic energy of that center of mass or center of gravity uh, plus the sum of the kinetic energies with respect to that center of gravity. You can also think about this in terms of work. You can say that the potential energy, excuse me, the kinetic energy at state 1 plus the work done from state 1 to state 2 is equal to the final kinetic energy. And then we have the conservation of energy principle, which just says that the kinetic energy initially plus the potential energy initially equals uh, the potential plus kinetic of those two things at the final state. So you can express this either as a work energy principle or as the kinetic uh, conservation of energy principle uh, and have similar results to what we did for a single particle or a non-discrete uh, rigid body rather than a system of particles. So in terms of impulse momentum, we know from forces equal to mass times acceleration, Newton's second law, that the summation of forces in any vector direction is also equal to the rate of change of linear momentum. And if we go through that equation, which we've done in the past, uh, we know that the linear momentum of a system at state 1 uh, plus the sum of those impulsive, those impulses, in other words, the force dt integral over some fixed period of time uh, is equal to the momentum at time 2. And we have a similar equation for moments being equal to the rate of change of angular momentum and applied moments over some period of time uh, being added to the angular momentum of the system at state 1 equals the system of state, the angular momentum at state 2. So the momentum of a particle at time t1 and the impulse of the forces from t to 1 form a system of vectors equipollent to the system of momenta which is the plural of momentum uh, of the particle at time 2. <clears throat> so we have uh, sort of like we're building a discussion of linear and angular momentum that is very, very similar to our discussion uh, of a single particle. So this problem uh, is in your textbook or a similar, uh, similar problem where we have a ball attached uh, to a cord of length L and it's suspended from a cart. So uh, what happens if the cart is initially at rest and the ball is given this initial velocity? What's the velocity of the ball when it reaches its maximum elevation? And what's the vertical distance? So there are no external forces. So this means that the impulse momentum print principle uh, is conserved and the relation can be solved for the velocity of B uh, at its maximum elevation. And also the conservation of energy principle can be applied uh, in terms of kinetic energy and maximum potential energy. Because, of course, when the ball reaches its maximum elevation, it will have a zero momentum, or excuse me, zero velocity, the ball itself, and that's going to be relative to the card at A if A is moving, uh, 
and is, but it will be at its maximum elevation will be its maximum potential energy at that time. So the, the solution is solved uh, just using a linear momentum. So we have the linear momentum of the ball and the cart initially equals the linear momentum of the ball and the cart finally. And so this is really nice because without any impulsive forces, it breaks down pretty quickly and uh, you're able to see uh, what that velocity relationship is. And when you think about this, the velocity of A at position 2 equals the velocity of B at position 2 because the relative velocity here is equal to 0. So that's kind of a nice consequence. Everything's moving at 2 in the horizontal direction. The ball is not moving with respect to the cart, but with respect to a fixed reference frame, it is moving with the same velocity at that instant as the cart. All right, and then just working this out, we have the position 1 potential and kinetic energy uh, of A <coughs> and B. And uh, we can go through and work this out for that height, which we will find in terms of uh, the mass of both of those objects, the initial velocity, and the gravity. All right, now this problem, sample problem 14.5, is also in your textbook. It's very similar to the problem I have assigned uh, for tonight, and or for this lecture, I should say. And if you go back and you look at the homework submission, it's all complete. The last problem from this problem set is 1431 and 1441. So in other words, for this entire chapter, you only have six problems, but they are quite lengthy to do. All right, so here we have an initial a ball that has an initial velocity. That's A, so it's a cue ball, more or less. And it hits ball B and then ball C. Okay, so in other words, A deflects off of B and hits C. And B and C are both at rest. It shows you where B and C hit the table, and it shows you where A hits the table. So we assume perfectly elastic collision, collisions. What are the velocities A, B, and C? And <clears throat> we're looking for, it's kind of funny because they don't use bolds, but if we're talking about velocities, we're talking about the vectors. Okay. I guess we know the direction, so um, we can just state the magnitude of those velocities. Uh, but it's really look, it asks for velocity, so it's really looking for vectors. Uh, this, so that we have four unknowns. We know that a, the velocity of a, it tells us in the problem, is purely in the y direction. Uh, we have a c velocity that is purely in the x direction, but ball b has a an x component and a y component. If we consider y being vertical on this and x being horizontal, although of course the pool table is not vertical and horizontal, but just to state our coordinate system. All right, so we can start with this. Once again, we have conservation of momentum, linear momentum, conservation of angular momentum, conservation of energy. Initially, the only thing moving is ball A, so the other quantities on balls B and C are zero. But at that point, uh, we can uh, break these into vectors. And this, of course, is not a vector equation. It's just a quantity. And we solve some equations. We get one, two equations. And we get, uh, essentially, uh, two unknowns. And so at that point, we can solve for v sub a, v sub c, and v sub b. Now, the thing I wanted you to notice is what we were talking about. They've written these as uh, quantities or as scalars, and they're not really velocities, are they? They're really speeds. But A is moving purely in the y direction, and C is moving purely in the x direction. So by the diagram, you can relate that back. But B, because it is not purely A or B, uh, we need to write it as a vector, and just to be... Uh, to have similarity, we also write it as that amount. 
All right, everybody. Well, that's it for uh, the PowerPoints. The next thing I want to do then is to look at problem 14.35 uh, from your textbook and uh, work that out for you. So that is in your notes here for the notes for lecture uh, for dynamics power, lecture 17. Uh, this is problem 35. So we have two automobiles, A and B. They have masses that are different and they're traveling in opposite directions when they collide head-on. The impact is assumed to be perfectly plastic, and it is further assumed that the energy absorbed is equal to its loss of kinetic energy with respect to the moving frame of reference attached to the center of mass of the two vehicle system. So the variables E sub A and E sub B are the energy absorbed by automobiles A and B. And they ask us to show that that ratio of energy absorbed is equal to the inverse of the ratio of the masses, uh, meaning that the amount of energy absorbed is inversely proportional to mass. Bigger vehicles absorb less energy. Smaller vehicles absorb more energy. Then we compute a, EA and EB. All right. <clears throat> they give you some masses and they give you speeds. Well, the first thing to notice about this is that those vehicles are coming right at each other. So vehicle A is moving toward vehicle B at 90 kilometers per hour, and B is moving toward A at 60 kilometers per hour. So that means that they are closing on each other with a sum of those two. So the closing velocity is 120, 150 kilometers per hour. Uh, so we can find the velocity of the mass center uh, just using the equations from the book. And then we can come out with uh, this expression, which basically has uh, VA prime, which is the velocity uh, with respect to G, and VB, which is the velocity with respect to B as well, G as well, excuse me. So then we can talk about the kinetic energy absorbed after the collision. Well, that's going to be, uh, it's sort of like kinetic energy. It's the kinetic energy absorbed. So we use V sub A prime squared, and we calculate out a number, um, and we find that to be uh, 18, 180,000 joules, which is 180 kilojoules. All right. Now, <clears throat> when we find T sub B, we can do exactly the same thing. Or we can also see that just going through this relationship, just dividing T sub A prime by T sub B prime, <laughs> excuse me, which is really E sub A prime over E, or e sub A over E sub B in the nomenclature of the problem, that when we reduce this equation, we find out that it's just equal to MB over MA. So, um, so what we do then is we take that ratio, and when we compute uh, this number, which actually I did this afterwards, so I did this first, and then I knew this, and so instead of going through the whole machination for coming up with um, E sub B. I just used the ratio and multiplied it by E sub A to determine the energy absorbed uh, by B. So what you see is the lighter car absorbs 320 kilojoules, whereas the heavier car only absorbs 180 kilojoules. And that's the reason why, in the absence of other factors, uh, larger vehicles tend to win in collisions. Like if you see, if you read any of the very troubling uh, accident reports of a small car hitting a Dodge pickup, for example, um, generally the smaller car has more damage done to it. Now, the good news is, is that design engineers have done a very good job of designing the cab um, or the interior of small cars and cars in general to absorb a lot of that collision in the structural damage to the car itself so that the space where the driver or the passengers uh, should be sitting will be relatively uh, less damaged than the rest of the car and that the rest of the um, damage will be taken up in the structural damage to the car itself. So that means uh, wear your seatbelt, right? And it also means another thing that uh, if you're when you're driving, don't don't have loose items in your cab. If you tend to like keep um, backpacks and duffel bags and coffee cups, those can become projectiles. Anything that's not restrained, so that's what your trunk is for. 
Uh, anyway, all right, so that's it for Chapter 14. Uh, the next lecture, 18, will be a review for the midterm exam, and uh, I will post that one tomorrow. And it will, so the exam will be taken sometime during this week. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know right away. Thank you.